You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 219, or 29th Q&A episode. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing real good since um, our first Naked Bible Conference is uh, selling quite well. So we're, we probably got just a little over 100 tickets left. So I just want to urge people to not wait because uh, yeah, I don't want them to miss out. So... Yeah, Please. that would be a bad idea to wait. It would be a bad idea to wait. So I did want to let everybody know that I will be recording that. So just know that. What live streaming is still up in the air, but um, the video, I will record it. And what we do with the video after that remains to be seen. So just know that at least it will be recorded. So I wanted, I getting, Mike, I'm getting tons right. of emails about that. So I just yeah. want to officially put that out there. And as the summer goes on, I will have more information about live streaming and things of that nature. So there's still hope. So I want people. But you're, to, you're not, you're not guaranteeing that, that, uh, the video taken will see the light of day anytime soon though. We don't, we don't know what, what we're going to do with that. Correct. Correct. It will see the light of day, but soon is the optimal word there. I wouldn't say yeah. soon. So yeah, it's, soon might be a year, you know, <laughs> who knows? Well, hopefully not, but, um, maybe so, um, you know, I just don't know yet. So as we inch closer to it and I'll work out more of these kinks to figure out what we're going to do, um, you know, we'll have that, those types of answers for you. So just know everybody that emailed me questions about the video and live streaming and all that. It remains to be seen. At least there will be video. And when you get to see that, I don't know yet. So there you hey, go. Hey, I can bring Calvin along and he can, uh, he has a video camera. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. Well, or we, we, you know, we can have everybody wear GoPros. You know, how's that? You know, yeah. Just yeah that, that, pass that, them out. That's exactly what we do not <laughs> right. want. So that's where we're at, not. right there. There you go. All right, Mike. Well, we lied to you last week. You said we were going to do um, uh, Baptism of the Dead, but uh, we're actually going to do two Q&As, one this week and one next week. And then after that, we'll pick up the topic about Baptism of the Dead. Yep. So I guess with that, you want to jump into these questions here? Sure, let's go. All right, our first one's from Stephanie, and she has a question regarding generational curses. In the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about the curse of the law and about blessings and curses. As Christians, are we still bound by those laws? Do we have to renounce what our parents did and our grandparents and so on? Yeah, I'm not quite sure from this question exactly what curses uh stephanie's talking about because you know cursing shows up a number of times in deuteronomy so if we're talking about curses tied to the land uh i would say well that's really not sort of in view because the the whole concept of the people of god isn't really tied you know specifically to the land and or uh israel failed you know, in those regards, and they were cursed. I'm thinking of, now I'm thinking of a passage outside Deuteronomy, like in Leviticus 26. It was very clear, if you do this or that, I'm going to drive you from the land, and that happened. You know, that was the exile, and so on and so forth. So if she's talking about that kind of stuff in Deuteronomy, you know, the Leviticus 26 kind of stuff, there's not really much of a connection. But I'm going to, I'm going to assume she's talking about Deuteronomy 5. Um, This is one of those generational curse passages that you know, is is a bit more, you know, sort of not attached to the land. It's a bit it's a bit broader. Let's put put it that way, or at least you know, not linked to that specific idea. So, on that assumption, I'll just let me read Deuteronomy five. We'll start in verse eight and go through verse ten. And again, I'm just guessing that this is probably what's what's uh, behind the question. Uh, that passage says, "You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth." A sidebar: There's your three-tiered cosmology again. Verse nine: You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. 
but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So that's the end of the passage. And you get this this third and fourth generation phrasing in this passage. So I'm guessing that's where this comes from. So to the question, you know, are we still bound by the, these laws? Well, in, in one sense, sure, we're not supposed to worship other gods. You know, we're not supposed to bow down to other gods. Uh, the third and fourth generation thing, uh, I think, though, is is kind of really what's driving the bus here. And I would say that, again, in, in my understanding, again, I'm not alone here, it's just in the academic understanding, third and fourth generation, that language is there because that essentially amounts to the lifetime, the lifespan of the person who commits the, the crime, so to speak. So biblically speaking, um, you know, generation is actually not a terribly consistent thing to nail down in the Old Testament, because the term is used in different contexts with different time spans, the longest of which would be 100 years uh, for a generation. So if you have this family heritage, if you want to take the long number, you know, it, it's probably not you know, something that's in the picture anyway. But when it comes to sort of human lifespans, human you know, lineages, that sort of thing. Uh, you, you're dealing with a generation being roughly 20 years, and that's that's defined in terms of just life, life experience. Where biblically speaking, people would get married, you know, when they're early and when they're younger than 20 years, they would have children, and those children would grow up again. They'd get married in their teen years, in the 20s, you know, whatever, and have, you know, babies and so on so forth. So a generation, you know, practically speaking, was roughly 20 years. And if you have third and the fourth generation, that's 60 to 80 years. Chances are the person who commits this offense is going to be dead by the end of the fourth generation. So this is another way of saying, you know, that I'm going to visit, you know, there's, there's going to be an effect of, of this sin. God is going to visit, you know, the, the sin of the father really as long as he lives the rest of his life and, and his children are going to be affected by it. So third and fourth generation is is pointing to a finite amount of time, even if you take the one instance I can think of where the term generation is, is sort of uh, attached to uh, to something that would be longer than 20 years. In, in case people who are listening are, are interested in, in, in what I'm thinking of there, it's the Genesis 15 passage where God is, is conversing with Abraham about what's going to happen to his descendants. They're going to go down into Egypt and be, you know, in bondage there for 400 years. And, and you have the, if, if you look at the passage, you have four generations uh, mentioned there. So we do the math, four divided by four, you know, 400 divided by four is 100 years. But So it, that, that's probably a, a broad general statement, because if you actually even go look at the generations involved uh, in national Israel from Abraham's time all the way up there, it, it's not very a very precise number. So, you know, what, what the exact meaning of that is, again, is debated by scholars. But when it comes to actual physical, genealogical generations, people typically in the biblical period got married before they were 20. So we use round numbers. So third and fourth generation is basically the natural lifespan of the person who commits the crime. So, in, you know, in that sense, you know, we've got, you know, a situation where, okay, let, let's just say that that's what what's going on here is that fair you know why why is you know why is god looking at, at this way why why does the passage say god's going to visit the iniquity of this person you know on the you know, to the third and fourth generation on the children part of this is, has to deal with sort of the middle eastern you know, ancient near eastern outlook uh, that scholars would refer to as corporate solidarity and the idea there is that society basic unity of society was not the individual but was the family and the extended family. Uh, so you have instances, both positive and negative, in the Bible where a person will do something, you know, like a sin, and the you know their their descendants will suffer uh, because of that. And you have the opposite as well, where if somebody does something good, then socially, just societally, their descendants will reap the benefits of what their ancestor did. Uh, the, the positive example, one of the, one of them anyway, would be uh, where you know, when David is basically trying to to lobby, you know, Saul that you know I'm going to go out there and kill Goliath. You know, he gets promised a bunch of things, and his his aunt, his descendants are included in the benefits that will accrue to David if he gets rid of rid of Goliath. 
So you have this sort of social sense that if you, in, in David's case, if you do this, you know, life's going to be better, you know, for your kids and their kids and so on and so forth. So you, there's this corporate idea going on in the ancient world that, that's very common. It's not just with Israel, but it's to other civilizations as well at the time. Now, for, for this question, though, I probably my favorite commentary on, on Deuteronomy is Tige's. I've, I've quoted it before. And I, I'll just read what, what Tige says about this idea, because there are other places in the Torah, in Deuteronomy, in fact, that are clear that there's individual responsibility going on, that, that you know, the, it's the idea that even though we have this sort of corporate mindset, basic unit of society, and there's you know, corporate solidarity and all that, it isn't necessarily the case that, that God is holding other people guilty for what somebody else does. So, I mean, there's a difference between suffering the effects of sin and being considered somehow a guilty party of something that happened before you were even born. So we have to balance out how we look at this language with other passages in the Torah and specifically in Deuteronomy. So Tige has a nice summary of this. He says, effective as this approach, approach may have been, again, this, this corporate thing, Deuteronomy 24, 16 forbids its application by judicial authorities. Uh, and he quotes the verse, parents shall not be put to death for children, nor children be put to death for parents. A person shall be put to death only for his own crime. That's the end of the verse. So that's very, it's a very clear statement of individual responsibility. And Tige continues, he says, but experience showed that people often do suffer or benefit because of the actions of their ancestors. Cross-generational punishment by God is partially mitigated in the Torah itself. In the Torah, only Exodus 34, 7 and Numbers 14, 18 state without qualification that God visits the sins of fathers upon children. In both versions of the Decalogue, that means both versions of the, of the Ten Commandments, the list of generations to be punished and rewarded is qualified by the phrases, quote-unquote, of those who hate me and, quote-unquote, of those who love me and keep my commandments. And our passage, Deuteronomy 5, 9, and 10, is one of those, one of those qualifying passages. The phrases most likely refer to descendants, meaning that cross-generational retribution applies only to descendants who act as their ancestors did. In other words, God visits the guilt of the fathers on future generations that reject him and rewards the loyalty of ancestors to the thousandth generation of descendants who are also loyal to him. In other words, God punishes or rewards descendants for ancestral sins and virtues along with their own if they, the descendants, continue the deeds of their ancestors. So that's the end of the TGA quote. So in other words, we can't just sort of lift Deuteronomy 5, 9, and 10 out and say, whoa, you know, you, this one of your ancestors did something before you were even born and you're going to suffer for it now. You know, God's going to remember that sin and is going to hammer away at you. Again, you have these other passages in the Torah that make it pretty clear that individual responsibility is 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 important, you know, to God. And so you you, you couple that with these qualifying ideas from other passages to say, well, essentially, if you walk the same walk, if you walk in the steps of your ancestors who did this thing, you're going to pay for it. You're going to suffer for it. Um, so that's a little bit different than suffering the residual effects, say, of a you know broken marriage or you know, maybe alcoholism or something like this, some, some sins that we're familiar with that have a long-lasting effect on people's lives, or at least could. That, that's a little different than, you know, God, you know, holding you, you know, guilty for something that happened before you were ever born. What Tige is suggesting here is that that really isn't the case. You know, the, there are these qualifying passages in the Torah that, that sort of make, again, following in their footsteps in, in a behavioral sort of way part of what's going on in these kind of statements in the Torah. Greg has our next question. In one of the podcasts, Dr. Heiser briefly mentioned the documentary Patterns of Evidence, which discusses an alternate <laughs> timeline for Egyptian history. The producers also mentioned that the histories of surrounding nations are tied to the Egyptian timeline. Sounds like serious implications if the producers are correct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's true. Uh, this this is a question that is really, really complicated. It's really not possible to give 
you know, any sort of detail in a format like this to this question. Um, even uh, I'm, I'm going to give it some broad brush strokes here, but even that is really not going to be adequate. If, if people out there in the audience are interested, and Lord help you if you are, in, in ancient chronology, <laughs> I say that as somebody who used to really be into this subject and, and sort of it became the pit of despair for all of the all of you who have sort of watched the princess bride uh it is a it is a quagmire of obtuseness complexity and difficulty and really no resolution so if you're but if if nevertheless you're still interested in ancient chronology please subscribe to the newsletter i've put four or five uh articles in the protected folder for newsletter subscribers by two authors, one of whom is Roll, R-O-H-L, and the other one is John Bimson, B-I-M-S-O-N. And the articles essentially talk about redating the Exodus chronology. And, and there you're going to get all the nuts and bolts. But I'm going to try to broad brushstroke this uh, as best I can. The, the, the issue is you do have serious problems in what is called third intermediate period chronology when it when it comes to ancient Egypt Egypt for you know some of the listeners may know you have like old kingdom new kingdom middle kingdom all that stuff well between those kingdoms you have intermediate periods and the and flash or i guess you know quick crash course on egyptian history you have kingdoms when you have one pharaoh and everything is sort of solid and stable in society. You have intermediate periods when people are competing to be pharaohs and things are just chaos. So that's how Egyptologists break Egypt's history down. So during one of these, the third intermediate period, which a lot of that overlaps with the divided monarchy in Israel, there are really significant problems in third intermediate period chronology. And this is actually where David Roll, uh, this, he dealt with TIP uh, chronology, third intermediate period chronology in his dissertations. So he, he sort of camps out here. And, you know, I, I've read a, a number of articles by Roll on this, and I, I think he's right. There are serious problems here. This is not the neat picture that other Egyptologists like to, to portray. Uh, so I think he's got a point. Now, the, the short version here is that you have missing names in king lists. There are gaps in the king lists for TIP chronology and, and other, other issues as well. So if you look at it the way Roll looks at it, you can compress the third intermediate period by a couple hundred years. Now, that means when you compress that period, all the rest of Egyptian history compresses with it. The, the timeline shifts forward in this case, since the third intermediate period is a late period. And if you do that, then the synchronisms between Egyptian history and biblical stuff change because you're moving the timeline. For anybody who's seen patterns of evidence, they try graphically to illustrate this, and I think do a, a pretty nice job of it visually. But, but if you compress the chronology, everything shifts. And this is what Roll is, is essentially arguing now. People who don't like Roll would say, well, you can't do that because there's a clear synchronism between one of those pharaohs in the third intermediate period, Pharaoh Shishank, and a biblical reference to Pharaoh Shishak during the time of Rehoboam. So you can't just shift things. We have a secure anchor. Well, that's not really the case. <laughs> Uh, one of the Bimson articles in the protected folder will show you in excruciating detail why the military campaigns of Sheshonk do not align in fundamental ways with the invasion of Shishak described in the Bible. They are they are markedly different. Um, you know, just by way of a few examples, you've got you know in 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 the biblical account Shishak and Jeroboam the king of the north were allies but in the egyptian account Sheshak attacks the northern kingdom and doesn't attack jerusalem but in the biblical account Shishak attacks jerusalem i mean th these are just fundamental disconnections between the military campaign stories of in egypt Shishak and in the Bible, Shishak. People have sort of just assumed these are the same guys because their names are kind of similar. 
But when you actually look at the descriptions of what you know happened with Shishak's invasion and Shashank's invasion, they, they are just I, I want to say miles apart. Maybe that's a, an exaggeration, but they are there are significant differences that really just can't be reconciled. And so if you don't have that synchronism, and that's really the the only quote unquote secure one you have where the Bible overlaps with the third intermediate period, then you can shift the, the Egyptian chronology all you want. Again, you know, again within the bounds of evidence. And this is what Roll does. He he shifts it, he compresses it, and that moves the timeline, which then in turn produces other synchronisms that today Egyptologists and biblical scholars don't see there because they're still playing with the old timeline. So you have Egyptian texts that seem to talk about the plagues. You know, you have Egyptian texts that seem to correlate, you know, with certain parts of the Exodus story. And nowadays people say, well, that no, that, that we can't use that as evidence because it's 200 years, you know, too early or 200 years this or that. But if you compress the timeline, then they line up. And so this is Roll's argument. Again, this is very broad brush stroke. If you want the nuts and bolts details, please subscribe to the newsletter. You can just read all that to your heart's content uh, and just get lost again in the vortex of ancient chronology. But, you know, my uh, personal opinion is there really are problems on the Egyptian side with this. And, and I just don't know how you surmount the disconnections between the Shesh, Sheshank and Shishak problem. I mean, for Egyptologists, it's easy. Well, the Bible's wrong. The Bible just got the details all screwed up. You know, and for some biblical scholars, that's where they go too. You know, it, either, again, they have no qualms with trying to figure this out because they, they want the synchronism. They need the synchronism to sort of make the picture what it is, r- regardless of their confessional commitment or lack thereof to any sort of sense of inspiration and biblical historicity and coherence. Uh, for, for those of us that we, that's just not, you know, like the first default position, oh, the Bible screwed up. And, and Roll, I mean, I don't think Roll is a Christian or anything like that, but Roll doesn't like arguments like that. And good for him because they're cheesy. You know, they, they cheat. They take the easy path. And, and he's taken a real close look at TIP, Third Intermediate Period Chronology. And, and I think he's right. I think, I think there really are problems. The problems need fixing. Now, my disagreements with Roll are going to be because Roll, quote unquote, fixes this problem. Then he wants to try to, to fix ancient chronology problems everywhere. And not just the Near East, but like everywhere all over the Mediterranean to have like one coherent system. And, and he winds up pressing the case too far in a number of respects. And he says goofy things. He says some truly goofy things. And, and I, that's really unfortunate because it makes him an easy target. Uh, it, it, it becomes a convenient thing to say, well, look at this silly thing he said over there. I'm not going to, you know, I, I don't have any reason now to listen to him when he talks about the Exodus chronology. That's just really unfortunate because just because he might, you know, do something that's just sort of a little weird or a little wild or, you know, doesn't really work well in one area doesn't mean that he's wrong everywhere else. But that's kind of how the mainstream looks at role. So it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. Nick wants to know if there is still potential for us to sin in the new heaven, new earth. Well, you know, I've said this before, since since our glorification doesn't mean that we become God or become Jesus, then we can't say that we that we are clones 100% of them and possess with exhaustive completeness their perfect nature. So that still means we're lesser, even though we're glorified. So in theory, and this is the way I always put it, in theory, that means, well, sure, we could, you know, we could have a hiccup. You know, we, we could, you know, we, we could commit some flaw or some wrong or something like that. You know, I'm only led to say that because we don't become Yahweh. There is only one uncreated creator. I mean, we don't become him. We don't become Jesus as though we are Jesus, but we do become as close, as, as, as like Jesus as we can possibly get. So you can say that we still aren't God, and therefore, you know, we, we aren't ontologically 100% the same. 
we don't have 100%, you know, God's nature and, and the nature of Jesus. So we're still lesser. And yes, that means that there's a, a possibility of rebellion. You can say that, but possibilities are not probabilities in any really meaningful sense in, in this case. Now, uh, I would illustrate it this way. It's possible, like I've said on Coast to Coast AM in a number of, of settings, it's possible, you know, that, that I could be the next American Idol that I could be president, that I could win an Academy Award, that I could win a Nobel Prize. All those things are possible, but they ain't going to happen, okay? <laughs> They're just not going to happen. The possibility is so infinitesimal that it's basically meaningless. And that's what we've got going on here. Ken asks, if salvation in the Bible is strictly loyalty to Yahweh, are modern believers of Judaism with loyalty to Yahweh saved while not embracing Jesus as the Messiah? No, they're not. Uh, to refuse Jesus is to reject Yahweh incarnate and to reject the plan of salvation that Yahweh came up with. So if you reject Jesus, you are, are rejecting the plan of Yahweh, the wisdom of Yahweh, and saying you, you got something better, or you like the old plan. You know, which, by the way, wasn't works to begin with. But you don't get to make the rules. You don't get to prefer one thing over the other when Yahweh says, this is my plan, this is the way of salvation. You can't reject his plan and be saved. You don't get to swap something else in. If you could, that sort of makes all the preaching of the apostles meaningless and kind of dumb you know, really, really just pointless, hopelessly self-contradictory. So, no, this is what Yahweh decided. Yahweh, again, came as a man in Jesus Christ, died on the cross, rose again, ascended to the, to the right hand of the Father, and all that stuff that the New Testament, including, of course, the book of Hebrews, talks about. And if you think that you can just sort of trade that in for something else— and, and, and say that, that you're still being loyalty, you're being loyal. You know, I'm, I'm, Lord, I'm rejecting the plan that you've given me, but I'm still loyal to you. That's just not coherent. Our next question is from A. Shep WB. In the Acts podcast, Dr. Heiser <laughs> said that idols were thought of as a house or dwelling place for those particular gods they were fashioned after. In Zechariah eleven seventeen, it says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean, dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. What is this verse trying to say in regard to idle shepherd? With my new understanding of what an idol is, it almost sounds like the idle shepherd will be indwelt by one of the divine council. Yeah, that... You know, the, the text really doesn't mean anything like that. There, there's, a, there's a translation problem here. Idle shepherd is uh, apparently, well, it's, it's not apparently, it is the King James translation, which is pretty awkward, and I would say pretty poor uh, in this instance. Now, I, I look, I've looked at the New King James, and the New King James actually doesn't have what the... Uh, the regular King James uh, has for here. The New King James is like basically every other translation, and they'll they'll translate the Hebrew word uh, as worthless or something like that. So, the, the word translated "idle" in in the the question in in the reading of Zechariah eleven seventeen that was in the question, uh, and you know again is reflected in the King James. That Hebrew word is "alil," and that term can be used and is used elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible for something that is weak or feckless or defective or useless or vain or worthless. For example, Job 13.4, uh, let's just read that passage just to give you one example. There are others. As for you, you whitewash with lies, worthless physicians are you all. So worthless physicians, the word worthless there is allele. So again, it has this idea of uselessness. And, and think about the context, Job 13, 4. Again, it's not talking about idols that are masquerading as physicians or divine council members that are sort of possessing or inhabiting physicians. It's not talking about anything like that. It's about physicians were useless in helping Job. They, they were worthless. They were, they were defective. They couldn't help it. They were totally ineffectual. And so that's what's going on in the Zechariah passage. A shepherd that deserts the flock 
is by definition useless because he's not doing the job of a shepherd. He's abandoning the job of the shepherd, so he is useless. So I don't think this has anything to do with the divine counsel. All right, Mike, there you go. That's all the questions <laughs> we have for this week. So you did it. Yeah. Well, what do you know? You know, I actually got through a bunch in a reasonable amount of time. That might be put it first. on the ca- put it on the calendar. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got nothing left to talk about now, other than we need to give. Uh, we got a live student uh, studio audience member, Robert. We need to give him a shout out. That's that's right. We, we let, let's turn him loose. <laughs> Robert, you want to unmute your mic there? Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I don't think. Okay, that's that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> You're, you're you're part of podcast history now. There you go. All right. Now, where that, are you from, Robert? I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. The only place mentioned a, a modern city in the Bible. Oh, here we go. At the Ark and Saul. Yep. Okay, we can edit that out. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, that's it, man. Uh, I guess we want to thank Robert for coming in the studio. We need to start doing a live audience. That'd be he's, fun. He's, he's snuck in. Yeah. He's in he's studio. Snuck in here I like that. Him. Yeah. that just sounds good. I like saying that. So, uh, all right, Mike. Well, that's really it. Unless there's anything else you'd like to nope, get off your chest. Nope, I think, I think we're done. All right. Sounds good. Well, we appreciate you answering our questions as always. And I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.